Hello and welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. I'm Brian Neville, the pastor here at Grace, and we're glad that you've joined us for our worship service today. Uh, thank you to all those that are watching online. Uh, you can follow along with our order of worship today. If you go to our Twitter feed, you can find that on gumc.org. And also today, we have Kara leading us in worship, and I'm excited to have her join us today. So Kara, let's, let's begin today in worship. All right, everyone, it's so good to be here. Um, I ask that if you could just um, close your eyes and let's start with a time of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for all that you have done. As we sing this song, Waymaker, remind us that you have made a way when there is no other way. And so, Lord, thank you for touching us. Thank you for turning our lives around. We bless you and we pray that this service would minister to those uh, who may be in a dark place. We pray that this would encourage the weak, strengthen the faint. Thank you, God, for loving us. So the 
next song is a new song from Grace, but you might have heard it on the uh, Christian radio, and it's called You Keep Hope Alive. And I really love the bridge where it says, there's hope in the breaking. I'm not sure many of you have had times of breaking this past year. There's hope in the sorrow, that even in your sorrow, there's hope. There's hope in this moment, and there's my hope for tomorrow. So will you join me in learning this new song? Days may be darkest. Days may be darkest. But your light is greater. You light our way, God. You light our way. When evil is rising. Evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. You keep, you keep hope alive, you keep hope alive from the beginning to end. Your word never fails, you keep you are alive Jesus you are alive death had a stronghold death had a stronghold but your life was stronger rose from the grave rose up from the grave when evil is rising you're rising higher with power to save with power to save. You keep hope alive. You keep hope alive. You keep hope alive from the beginning to end. Your word never fails. You keep hope alive because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive. your living hope because you're breathing there's hope in the breaking hope in the sorrow hope for this moment my hope for tomorrow you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end your word never fails you Because you are alive, Jesus, you are alive. Amen. Praise God. This time we're going to transition to a time of tithes and offering. And I invite you to give generously to the work of our church as we continue to do ministry uh, to a community that, that gathers in small groups here at the church and uh, the work that we do out in the community, how we try to make a difference and transform people's lives uh, for the good, to, to establish God's kingdom here on earth. There's three ways you can give. You can give by sending a check in at, to 555 Russell Avenue here in Wyckoff, New Jersey. You can also use a push pay app on our website, gumc.org. You can also uh, use the PushPay app on your phone and then just search for the zip code 07481. Uh, those are the ways that you can give to our church. So we appreciate your generosity in supporting the ministry of this church. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for the work that you're doing in and through us. Thank you for the transformation you are working in our lives as we seek to be uh, the people of God at work in this world. Thank you for Kara and her ministry. Thank you for the worship team and the work that they do in this church. And the small groups that we have, the missions work of many people to help those that are in need. God, we do these things because that's what you call us to do. That's the invitation that you extend to us. May the gifts that we give 
be an extension of that invitation as we invite others to participate in the work that you have for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Well, last week, many people watched in shock as U.S. citizens pushed past police and broke into the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. I've since heard from several of you about how this has impacted you. Some are angry, some are scared, some of you aren't sure how to feel. The seizure of the Capitol is surely an important sign, even if we aren't quite sure what it signals. The struggle is, what do we do about all? I've heard calls to pray for our nation, and certainly prayer is good, but do we write to Congress? Do we demand changes? Do we march on Washington for democracy or something else? Perhaps a more likely response is to do nothing, to simply throw our hands in the air and say we can't change these things. It is what it is, and we are resigned to our fate as a nation. We have developed a habit of indifference. That's often what happens when we feel stuck on a problem or powerless in a situation. We do nothing. So we are going to spend the rest of the month looking at some big problems, some things that may make us feel powerless and consider the kind of response to which God invites us. Uh, last week, Paul gave the sermon and he talked about how we all pray and many times we ask God for something and our prayers are answered. Instead of gratitude, though, sometimes we become arrogant as if God had nothing to do with those answers. Many times our prayers are answered. But today, we're going to look at the other side of the coin. Why do we pray and sometimes our prayers go unanswered? We may feel like, what's the point? Prayer is not going to change anything anyway, so why pray? Let's dive in with our scripture for today and see if we might be able to discern the reason we pray. What's the point and how we might move forward uh, toward this uh, a greater purpose in our prayers. Our scripture is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 18 through 22. Paul is going to share with us by video today's reading. I invite you now to hear the word of the Lord. In the morning, when he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the side of the road, he went to it and found nothing at all on it but leaves. Then he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they were amazed, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be lifted up, and thrown into the sea, it will be done. Whatever you ask for in prayer, with faith, you will receive. And from Genesis 32, 28, then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, we pray that we may truly be an inclusive community, passionately following Jesus Christ. Help us to hear you speak to us today, that we may live a life of genuine, abiding faith. Amen. I thought you'd appreciate this joke. Uh, a woman was well known for her faith and for talking about it. She would stand on her front porch and shout, Praise the Lord! Next door to her lived an atheist who would get so angry at her, he would shout, There ain't no Lord! This woman, she uh, fell on hard times and would pray to God to send her some assistance. She stood on her porch and shouted, Praise the Lord! God, I need some food! I'm having a hard time! Please, Lord! Send me some groceries. 
And the next morning, the lady went out on her porch and saw a large bag of groceries and shouted, Praise the Lord! The neighbor jumped out from behind a bush and said, Aha! I told you there was no Lord. I bought those groceries. God didn't. And the lady started jumping up and down and clapping her hands and said, Praise the Lord! He not only sent me groceries, but he made the devil pay for them. Praise the Lord! These are the kinds of stories that we like. A prayer is offered by someone in need, and a prayer is answered, maybe even in unexpected ways. But it's a cut and dry case. But too often, life is not like that. I know of a woman who was pregnant with a baby. The parents had struggled for years to have a child, and partway through the pregnancy, she was told, if you bring this baby to term, you are going to die. She told her pastor, I thought God could and would do anything if enough people prayed. But, God, uh, but people did pray, and God didn't do anything. It seemed to this woman that God had turned his back on her. What good was a God that wouldn't save her baby? Many struggle with this, especially because so many Christians claim that God answers their prayers all the time, even for things that seem to be of no consequence. I remember when I was a little boy and my mom prayed for an open parking spot at the grocery store, uh, and then it happened. Someone pulled out and she got rock star parking and praised God for it. Uh, just yesterday, I caught myself praying for my football team, the Buffalo Bills, to win their football game. And then they won. Uh, just a few days ago, the heating guy came into uh, my office here at the church. Uh, you may be longing to be back here in this building, but count your blessings. It has been freezing cold in this building for weeks. As he got to work, I told him I'd be going to another room if he needed me for anything. And he said, Say a prayer for me that I can get your heating working. <laughs> Does God decide who gets heat and who doesn't? Does he control the outcome in sports and parking spots, but utterly ignore the rest of us when it comes to cancer and unborn babies or the pandemic? turns out we are not alone when it comes to these questions, and there are even examples in the Bible of specific unanswered prayers, what is going on that we say God is loving and kind, yet our prayers for health and life and love go unheeded? As we dive into this series on indifference, one clear cause of that apathy toward God is when we pray at our most desperate hour and nothing happens. Why? People say, fine, if, if God won't watch out for me when I need him, then he must not exist. Or they say, if he ignores me, then I'll just ignore him. And if that's what's really going on, if that's what's really happening, they are being perfectly reasonable. I think a path out of this pattern has to be to answer this seeming contradiction. Let's see if we can understand what prayer is, what it's meant to be, and why our prayers go unanswered. Jesus says in Matthew 21, if you have faith and do not doubt, whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. It looks like Jesus is promising to give us whatever we want. We might pray a little selfishly then. God, give me a million dollars. I'll even do good things with it. And we think we've got God good now. I prayed so he must deliver. Or maybe we pray not for ourselves, but for others, for someone to get a job, get well, or good things for our children. And we are confused when we ask in prayer, in Jesus' name, and it doesn't happen. Why? You'll, you'll find plenty of answers on the internet, and if it is to be believed, it will tell you the problem is you. You are not trying to do God's will, so you didn't get what you prayed for. You have sin in your life, and until you confess it, God won't answer. You pray with the wrong motives. You lack faith. It's all the same idea. The problem is not God, it's you. This is a classic case of blaming the victim, and this way of thinking is full of holes. If you think carefully about it, you'll see what I mean. If someone is sick 
and dying, and God doesn't answer your prayer because you have sin in your life, what does that say about God? God is literally willing to kill people to teach you a lesson about your sin. It makes no sense. God would be sinning a bigger and far worse sin than you to force you into living a good life. What malarkey. Instead, we see Jesus over and over offering unconditional love and and concern for those who suffer. The blind man is healed just because he asked in Mark 10. The woman's dead son is raised to life in Luke 7. These people didn't do anything to earn Jesus' response to their need. The point is not, we are not good enough for God to help and heal us. It's that God is good enough to heal and help. We don't have to be perfect for God to want to help. God just does it. God wants to answer our prayers. But what about faith in Matthew 17, 20? Right after the disciples could not cast out a demon, but Jesus could, they ask him why they couldn't do it. He says, because of your little faith. He goes on to say they can move mountains if they have the faith the size of a mustard seed. Very similar to today's passage in Matthew 21. In another place, the disciples are, again, unable to help someone who is sick. When they ask Jesus why they couldn't help the person, he says, prayer is what was needed. Usually we put this on ourselves. If only I had prayed more or had more faith. But that is not what Jesus is saying. When he says the faith of a mustard seed, he's not saying, oh, if only you had a little more faith. He's saying even an inkling of faith, the tiniest bit of faith, is enough to accomplish this. It's not if only I had more faith. It's if you have any faith. If you trust God, you'll see his will accomplished. And when it comes to praying, our minds often go in the same direction. If only I had prayed more, I could have changed the outcome. God would have listened and saved that person from their fate. No, that's completely wrong. Jesus isn't saying pray more to force God's hand. He's saying prayer is the only thing that is effective. Because prayer puts it all in God's hand. In ancient times, an exorcist would have told everyone how powerful they were, how they could manipulate spiritual powers. They would have used smelly roots or even used what we would call today pain compliance techniques. Uh, We might say something like, you're twisting my arm to make me do it. In ancient times, they would literally twist your arm or use pressure points to force you into physical submission and then assert that that was spiritual forces at work. When Jesus uses prayer for exorcism, what does he do? He says, he simply says, Spirit, I command you to come out. Is Jesus forcing his will on that person? No. Is he manipulating them and calling it spiritual power? No. He just prays and lets God's will unfold. So if it's not sin that causes prayer to go answered, unanswered or a lack of faith on our part, then why do our prayers not have the effect we want? Let's look at what prayer really means for a moment. Who among us would pray for a million dollars and expect God to just make that money appear? God doesn't reconstruct the molecules around us to form paper and ink out of thin air. Money comes from people and printers. Who among us would send our children to play in the middle of the street telling them, it doesn't matter if you get hit by a car, we'll just pray for you afterward and you'll be all better. No, of course not. That would be criminal. Cars do real damage, and it would be absolutely foolish to put a child in harm's way like that. God doesn't heal us so we can live reckless lives. Prayer is not about our wishes being granted. Prayer is not about the reality of the world around us being bent to our will. Instead, God calls us to pray for entirely 
different reasons. What are some of those reasons? What is prayer supposed to be? Paul shared with us last week about the Lord's Prayer. It's a simple, beautiful prayer that was actually probably already widespread at the time. It's a prayer from the Jewish Pharisees, and Jesus is affirming its use. Yes, good. That's the kind of prayer you should pray. It's a prayer for the kingdom of God in heaven to come down here to earth. That means it's not the desires of people that are being accomplished. It's God's desire accomplished here on earth. Then we say, give us this day our daily bread. That's not a line about us getting all the food we want, whatever we want. Daily bread is a word that until just a few years ago, we had no idea what it actually meant. That's because the only place in the whole history of the world that word ever showed up was this one prayer in the New Testament. We came up with daily bread as a best guess translation. The word is abusios, and the church a thousand years ago translated it as daily or super substantial bread. So it's it's special. It fills our souls. It is bread that only God alone can provide. But guess what? They recently found that word on an old piece of paper in Egypt. This find helps us finally get the meaning of this word right. And daily bread is actually bread from our grocery list. Probably not what you were expecting, is it? But think about it. That might actually help us understand what prayer is really supposed to be. When we pray for what we need... What do we pray for? What do we actually need? For many of us, we can hardly think of a world that isn't overflowing with all kinds of stuff. We think we need cell phones and TVs and video games and cars and big houses and everyone we know to always be safe and healthy. The only thing Jesus puts on that list is the bread for that day. So we can cook a meal for our family and eat. It is an incredibly modest request. I think that hints at where our thinking needs to be when it comes to prayer. Sure, there are plenty of examples of these big, amazing things happening in the Bible, miraculous things that have reshaped the history of the world, but do we really think that those incredible biblical experiences that happened over almost 2,000 years of history should happen regularly, even daily, in our own lives? Is the supernatural intervention of God supposed to be a ho-hum, ordinary occurrence for us? I know a church that had uh, dozens of people in it that genuinely believed miracles should be happening every single day, and that if they weren't, it was because of the people lacking faith. They were so sure of their beliefs that they demanded that the pastor start praying for miracles to happen every week in church. You can probably imagine how problematic that was. Eventually, because they didn't see enough miracles, they ran the pastor out of the church. And then because everyone else didn't have enough faith, they decided to leave the church too. The demand for prayers to be answered our way caused the church to be in turmoil. Surprise! Forcing things to happen our way causes problems. Instead, Jesus says the prayer of faith is a prayer for our daily bread. Instead, Jesus teaches us to pray to forgive and to be forgiven for the wrongs we do to others. See, God is doing something miraculous as we pray for food and prayer to be forgiven. Every day, people put seeds in the ground, and the sun and water nurtures those seeds. The air brings life into that little plant, and it grows until it is harvested and becomes food for a person or another animal. This process happens every day, and every day, almost eight billion people have enough food for that day. God provides our daily bread. When we forgive one another, we let go of resentment and judgment, of hate and bitterness that is a poison to ourselves. You are free when you forgive. I think of the tiny particles that make up our universe. Have you ever wondered about atoms and what makes an atom stick together? There are protons and neutrons and electrons, but why do they stay the way that they are? There's something called gluon that in some 
fantastic, unbelievable way, keeps it all together. That's what God does on a cosmic level. Every day, our lives are possible because God is holding it all together. It is a miracle of epic proportions, but we don't call it that because miracles by their nature must be outside of the ordinary. When we pray, we pray to God in honor of these fundamental principles that hold the universe together and keep us alive. We thank God for the air we breathe and the clean water that gives us life for another day. Now, I know this leaves much to be desired. Should we stop praying for miracles? No, of course not. But we've got to keep our desires, our way of looking at the world in check and trust that God is at work. God knows, God hears, and God is working on the fundamental goal of bringing heaven to earth where there is no pain, where there are no more tears. Can you pray with faith that God is establishing a new order that is changing the fabric of this universe? Despite your pain, despite your losses, can you pray that God is good and that you trust God no matter what. That is a prayer of faith that will indeed move mountains. Last thing. There was a a mother named Monica who prayed for her son. She wanted him to be a Christian, but she kept having problems with him. Uh, She would go to God and tearfully pray for his conversion. She even caught wind that her son, at just 16 years old, was planning to run away by sneaking onto a boat and never coming back home. She prayed and prayed that her son would not get on that boat, but he did. He ran away, and she never saw him again. She was heartbroken, but in the midst of this, God was not idle. Monica's son was named Augustine, and one day he would indeed experience conversion, and he would become one of the greatest theologians the world has ever seen. He says of his mother, and what did she beg of you, my God, with all those tears, if not that you would prevent me from sailing? But you did not do as she asked you. Instead, in the depth of your wisdom, you granted the wish that was closest to her heart. May we have eyes to see and ears to hear that God may not give us what we want, but he is granting us the deepest needs of the human heart. May we pray for the kingdom of God and for the faith that it will come here to earth. Amen? I'd like to close today with a creed. So as the words appear, I invite you to join with me. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we pray that as we express our prayers to you today and in the coming weeks, that we might experience that fundamental shift from the desires of our will to what you have for us. 
that we might take a step back from our own pain and our own suffering, our own situations, and see that there's a, a grand scheme that you have at work to bring the kingdom of God here to earth. May we pray like Jesus prayed before he went to the cross. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Change us. Change our hearts. And Lord, help us to not stop and, and lack faith in those situations that are on our hearts. We do pray for those who are sick, who are suffering. We pray for those who are in need today. Help us, Lord, to be the answer to those prayers. That we might care for one another. That we might be the answer to prayer for others. As we do your will, as we seek your kingdom, as we live as Jesus taught us to live. And we pray now, Lord, as you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing one last song together as we close. Church, we're going to sing a very um, popular hymn, but it was written by Anthony Showalter in 1887 when he received letters from his former students that both their wives died. And so while he was writing these letters, he was inspired by Deuteronomy 33, 27, and it says that the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And that, folks, is the background of leaning on the everlasting arms. the 
blessing. May the God over all things go with you. May you experience peace and life and hope in the one who is with us in every situation. Go with the peace and joy of knowing that God does hear you. God does answer your prayers. God is with you always and forever.